Very good. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to everybody joining this LinkedIn Live. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Judy Ferguson, the Chief Executive Officer uh, at the Merchant Risk Council. Uh, Judy and I will be chatting today around uh, this belief that there's a new C-suite role um, and talking about the Chief Payments Officer and the role of education uh, and in driving greater understanding of payments in many organizations across the world. Uh, I'm Rory O'Neill, the Chief Marketing Officer of Checkout.com, and we'll spend the next sort of 25 minutes or so uh, debating and discussing this topic, and we welcome any questions. So, Julie, maybe if I could first of all just ask you to introduce your role at the MRC and maybe say a little bit about the role of the MRC in the world of payments. Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO of the MRC. I'm actually one of the original co founders of the organization, and next year's our 25th year. Um, and our mission is really to be the go to place for payment and fraud professionals. Um, and we want to educate people. Um, we have an advocacy initiative, and then we have events all over the globe. And so we are in um, the US, Europe, uh, Latin America, and Asia Pacific. And we have um, members in 79 countries. Um, so whenever you think about MRC as a global nonprofit, just think about the world. We operate in 24 time zones, we often joke. That's terrific. And, uh... Uh, it's great you're joining us from obviously from Texas today, but you've got scope to be anywhere in the world at any point in time. So uh, <laughs> it's a terrific piece, uh, Julie. And uh, talk to us a little bit about the the role that MRC plays then in, in driving the education of the payments industry. Because I guess as we know, no no one no one's born with payment knowledge, Julie. So so how do professionals acquire this? You know, yeah, very complex and very detailed topic. I've been in this industry for over 25 years and payments used to be kind of 25 years ago. It was like the back room. It's almost like a dirty word. People didn't really talk about it. And there really wasn't a way that you got trained or educated other than somebody taught you who was already in the role. So it was a lot of on the job training. And yeah. it's been fascinating as uh, you know, with the rise of the internet um, and all these really cool new ways to pay, it's become more and more important. And so people are really saying, wow, I want to be in fintech. Wow, I want to do payments. Um, and anybody who's in payments and fraud knows once you've had a taste, you're hooked. It's super fun. You're always learning. It's always changing. Um, and so, you know, from the MRC's perspective, we really feel that it's our mission to help educate people and create um, the next generation of, of people to take over the, the, and run the world of payments. And um, you know, we've had universities reach out uh, to us through the years and um, our members have been asking us for a long time to create a certification program so that when you actually say, I know payments and fraud, you really, there's a way to prove it. Um, and also our members have been asking for a long time, hey, can you really create some online learning? And so um, about two years ago, we actually embarked and launched all that stuff. And uh, it's, it's starting to take off and um, create that true um, path, career path into payments. Yeah, it's terrific. And look, at, I know, Julie, we, we share your passion on the role of education and how important it is uh, in the payment space. At, at Checkout, we actually train all 1,800 of our teams worldwide uh, on our own payments uh, essentials course. And we're obviously delighted to, to, to partner and sponsor uh, the MRC payment essentials course uh, with you guys um, to, to sort of you know, do exactly as you say and help more people into the into the career of payments. And I, I guess, why, why is it, Julie, that it's now more interest? I mean, you mentioned there the adoption of digital payments. Is it is it because payments is getting more complex that this is getting more interesting? Or is there genuinely an understanding now that actually this stuff really matters to consumer experience and ultimately revenue within a business? Um, I think both, right? So, so I think the consumer experience um, has gotten really important, especially with the evolution of online commerce. Um, now consumers can easily go from one store to the next to look for products where you used to have to get in your car and drive mm -hmm. to kind of price comparison. Now it's just a couple of clicks. And so you want to make it easy for that consumer to pay. And, and I think there's a great recognition on uh, in the industry of, you know, making it easy to pay. And we've actually seen that with a lot of these new emerging payment types. Um, you know, you know, Apple Pay um, at, at the point of sale as well as online, um, making it easier and easier. Amazon with their one-click buy, um, so that that increases conversion, which increases revenue, 
And so I think the C-suite takes a look and says, how can we increase revenue? And one of the big green fields is with payments. And, um, you know, I think th the biggest challenge to making that successful has been people don't have the common language and understanding to have that conversation. And that's why mm. we're so excited to partner with you guys to make the payment essentials class free to all of our MRC members and, and get everybody talking <clears throat> that same language. So it's complimentary to anybody in an or member company. And what's been really fascinating since we launched this a couple weeks ago is we have people from all different parts of organizations yep, uh, yep. taking it, you know, so developers, people in the treasury department, um, entire teams of customer service. So it's really exciting to see because one of the challenges and why we even created this, this sponsorship opportunity and this partnership with you is when you say, what's an authorization? Everybody has a different definition. There is not a common definition of what is an auth. And so if you start to level the playing field of, of just the basic vocabulary and how payments work, you can really start to expand what's going on. No, 100%. No, double click on a couple of items there, Julia, if we can, because uh, I remember uh, trying to learn the payment industry about five or six years ago when the, my colleagues I was working with at the time uh, were certainly uh, had a command of different acronyms that I certainly didn't have an, a, a command of. So it was very important for us all to talk this, the same language. But I just wanted to double click there a little bit on um, something you said around you know the payment experience and the evolution because I mean ultimately a brand's interaction with its consumer you know can end with a payment um, and obviously many brands want to encourage that and sort of you know see how that how that works but I, I wonder if um, you know the end of the day the industry talks a lot about this payment experience yet consumers actually don't really like to pay for anything so I guess the industry's whole job is to kind of you know make itself invisible. And for that, I guess you need to deeply understand the topic to make something so perfect and so frictionless and so simple that it's actually invisible. I mean, is, is that the right way of putting it? It absolutely is. It's, it is, um, you want to make it fun to pay, right? So uh, I think uh, Timu is a great example who have, they're really experimenting with a lot of crazy things. And I'm, I made a purchase uh, just for fun this weekend and they actually gamified it. So the first purchase yeah. I made, I got 80% off and then I won a coupon for hundred percent off if I bought one more thing. And so it, it just kept going and you really start to see the evolution of consumer experience. Um, and so, and even a little bit of the gamification in it, you know, the loyalty programs that merchants offer today um, are also really important and they are deeply intertwined with payments now. Um, so, so I know that I've done a lot of crazy things to get that awesome coupon or that gr they get my loyalty points, right? So consumer behavior definitely changes when we're incented. Got it. And then the second piece you mentioned is the I guess this sort of you know very simple understanding that unless a business can take a payment actually there's no path to revenue if there's no path to revenue there's no way to generate any cash so i think it's probably not too simplistic to think that every business actually exists to do two things one is to market innovate the services and products that they they build themselves and the second is to actually take a payment um so does that explain you know more of a drive and more of a rise in the kind of like payments being talked about in various parts of the organization yeah, absolutely. And and I think it's also been front and center um, in the regulatory world. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, with consumer uh, protections that are in place and uh, lots of different card uh, network mandates, you know, last year there were over 25 card network, 2,500 card network mandates that impacted merchants and ultimately consumers. And that's a lot of change. And so I think that that has gotten a lot of attention within organizations and, and made payments, not only that customer experience, but that regulatory aspect, um, something that people are really starting to talk about and focus on. No, that makes total, total sense. And 2,500 mandates. I mean, I think the I think the only thing we can say is that there's going to be more regulation as you go around the different you know, uh, you know nation states around the world and the way that things are, are regulated, which obviously leads itself to that complexity. So, so, so I guess the the one of the demands that we're seeing is that there's more and more payments roles. I think LinkedIn have it that you know they've seen a forty five percent increase in open positions in the payments field, um, and I guess you know that's being driven again by this demand of like for payments professionals. So, is that where the payments essential course is really targeted? Is it is it for folks that are new to payments that need to learn about it? 
Yeah, that it's those that are new, they need to learn about it. But I will also say when I went to study for the uh, CPFPP, the Certified Payment and Fraud Prevention Professional, I actually went back and went through that course because as I was studying for it, I've learned it all ad hoc through, you know, the last uh, 25 years of my career and I had a couple gaps. And so um, it also is a, a complete complete education and overview of the, the, the e-commerce world. And so it gave, it filled in those gaps. And so even if you're an expert, it, it doesn't hurt to go through and it's, an, it's formatted in an adult learning style. So if you're like, see a chapter, oh, I know that, you can actually skip that chapter. So, um, and just take the, the, the quick summer knowledge check test. I think with my basic knowledge, Judy, I won't be allowed to skip any chapters, but I appreciate that that feature is there for the, for those that know. I think it's, uh, it's, it's again, super interesting. We spent a bit of time with um, some merchants in the uh, checkout customer advisory board just recently. Um, and we asked them like, you know, what's the one thing, you know, vendors like checkout could do to help them increase the, the knowledge of payments across their organization. Their, their ultimate response and very quick, swift response was, please train the basics of the C-level um, we'll change, change the uh, sea level rather with the basics of payment. So we're all speaking this common language. So I think it's a it's a wide ranging skill, I think, to, to get across. And, and I guess, Julia, having been in the industry for you know some time now, what is it maybe you could comment on like some of the skills and emerging skills that you're seeing? Like how, how has payments training or pay, payments education changed in the last five years per se? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that's changed is um, the complexity. And so we used to just pay by default with Visa and MasterCard. And I think now when you are a company, most companies have to sell outside the US, right? So so now if you're, if you're based in Europe, you're gonna try to sell to the US. So you have to learn um, the how to do payments, the currency conversion, um, all the complexities with moving money around between countries. So payments have gotten really complex. And what really shocked me early on in my career as I started to look at payments holistically across the globe is that credit cards is not the default way that people pay in every country. Right. Um, you know, when you look at Southeast Asia, everybody's paying with a QR code directly to their bank. It's, it's the craziest thing. And in fact, I, I was at a vending machine. I had cash and credit cards and I could not buy a bottle of water. I had to have one of my coworkers buy it because I didn't have that, that pay by bank functionality. And so what we're now seeing in the last five years is all these awesome technologies from other regions starting to be available to consumers all over the world. So, um, you know, there's there's pay by bank that's emerging. There's uh, PIX in Brazil had wild success. Mm -hmm. And now Europe is looking at launching um, Wiro is what they're calling it. So the ideal uh, was bought by the EPI and they're gonna be rolling out the Wiro payment method. And so um, there's just so much going on. Um, and the more payment types you offer, the higher your conversion rate. It's a, it's a proven fact in many studies and by many merchants sharing data. No, I think look, I guess it's it's very perceptive. I think there's um, you know the, the growing importance of you know global cross border trade, how you reach all these different consumers, and of course, I think uh, you know in markets like China, when you're talking about AliPay or WeChat Pay, it's definitely very wrong to call those alternate payment methods. Uh, they just are the payment methods, uh, um, and there's great innovation that's being driven you know by the tech, but also I guess by consumer demands. I mean, I think in China, you know, a Chinese millennial will order you know, uh, concurrently from three different delivery, uh, fast food delivery networks or applications, and then cancel the two that are the slowest uh, in terms of how they work. So that, that puts pressure, I think, on, on the payments ecosystem and, and, and how things merge. So, so we've spoken a little bit, Julia, about how the, the kind of this helps the kind of, I guess, those new to payments or getting a refresher on payments. But are you seeing any trends, particularly on, you know, how senior payment professionals are getting inside the organization? Is it becoming more of a C-suite conversation about what's happening with payments? It is absolutely becoming a C-suite. In fact, I was reflecting on this the other day. In my career, I've seen the, the rise of the chief security officer, and I've seen the rise of the chief privacy officer. And um, I was like, wow, how did that happen? What, what, what made that happen? And you know, how can I compare that to the payments industry? Mm. And I will say, 
Um, there were uh, pressures from the regulatory bodies that made those things um, really become a, a, a seat at the, the C-suite table. Um, and then the second thing is that it had a negative and a positive impact to consumer, the t consumer experience with a business. So if your security is poor, then the consumers aren't going to interact with you as a business anymore, right? So that's why the chief security officer um, became became you know, created and, and rose to the top. And and when I reflect on the payments officer, um, you know, we really hear a lot about trust and safety and and um, you know how does how does payments work across the the ecosystem? And we have those regulatory pressures, and they're growing every day. Um, so the regulators are getting more and more involved, um, unfortunately, um, in, in payments yeah. um, and making it more complex. But I think also that, um, you know, that consumer experience, creating that loyalty and stickiness among the consumers and how a consumer feels if they have a bad experience making a payment also materially matters. Right. So um, if you have an account takeover um, at, at your at, at your site, how do you handle that customer calling in? Um, and so I always say that payments and fraud is like breathing in and breathing out. They are so closely tied together. And so just knowing that we have that regulatory pressure and that consumer experience has become front and center on the payment experience, I think those pressures are really pushing that job up. And I've actually seen, so, you know, when we first started out, the, the payments and fraud people, um, or typically the people on the security or loss prevention team. Yeah. Um, and then we started to see it move into treasury roles about 10 to 15 years ago. And so sometimes payments is in treasury, sometimes it's in tech, um, it kind of, sometimes it's, it's its own little group. Um, but now that payments are really becoming a strategic weapon for businesses to get more customers and create that loyalty, um, I have seen it rise, um, you know, the last probably 10 years, we've seen a lot of VPs of commerce. Um, and now we're seeing in quarterly filings. In fact, I was watching Sony announce some of their really cool tech um, the other day, and they had a couple minutes dedicated to what they're doing around payments. So they, they actually gave me goosebumps. It was so exciting to say, oh, yeah, it's a part of their strategy. But we're seeing that everywhere. You know, you, you look at um, these uh, electronic, you know, uh, electric vehicles that are coming out. And now they're talking about making them payment instruments as well, right? Your car is going to be yeah. your wallet. I mean, so so it's really, really becoming um, front and center, um, a way, a part of that conversation of customer experience. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. As you, as you say, you've got the historical kind of regulation piece, which is getting more and more complex, continuing to drive the complexity part of the conversation. Um, certainly on the on the CX, the whole customer experience lens, I, I've often seen that um, you know people think about payments way too late when they're designing the optimum CX and the customer journey, um, and it's again kind of ironic because unfortunately payments has because of the change in regulation and the complexity has some some of the uh, lowest common denominators uh, in terms of customer experience are actually have the most restrictions are in the payments piece. So organizations kind of have to put those first or think about them way before sometimes even when they're thinking about, you know, web experience or software experience, they have to kind of think about the payments piece first. And as you say, it's, you know, 100% directly correlated with revenue and that trade off, I guess, between how much you trade on fraud and protect and protection versus, you know, the payment acceptance kind of, you know, revenue side of the story. So, so super interesting in that perspective. But have you seen more chief payments officers, Julie? Do you, do you see that title banded around? Yeah, I actually am starting. I know a couple now, so it's starting um, starting to to emerge. Um, I've also seen a couple of chief trust and safety officers who happen to own payments. Um, yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure exactly what that title is going to be, but I now see that 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 person um, sitting at the the C suite table. Um, there's been a couple of chief innovation officers as well who are in charge of payments. Um, so it's it's really starting to morph um, into having a seat at that table. No, it's great. It's great to hear, I think, again, from a strategy perspective and those sort of pieces. But we're, we're definitely interested in partnering with you, Julie, to make sure we land on a title. We like the CPAO uh, at checkout. We're, we're, we think that's a great, uh, you know, neat title for, for, the, for these folks. Um, I guess, Julie, it would be remiss of me if I didn't ask about 
um, AI and the role of AI in payments? Like, how, how do you see merchants using AI? Is there any kind of growing trend there that you, you want to cover for anybody listening today? Yeah, you know, it's interesting you ask that. So um, the merchant industry has been using AI for as long as I can remember with machine learning, right? So the, the new thing is the generative AI and the speed and, the, and, and there's been some innovations in the last couple of years that make it super cool. And we actually saw a lot of merchants quickly scrambling of how can we you know, use AI for customer service and how can we use AI for fraud detection? And we certainly see all the crooks using it um, to do bot yeah. attack, and spam and spear phishing and all that great, great stuff. But um, what's been interesting to me in the last six months is some of the merchants have said, we've had to slow it down a little bit because the computing power that is required to do these AI decisions is very expensive. And so where a lot of people said, oh my gosh, it's gonna change the world overnight and it's going to replace all our jobs. Um, the, the good news story is probably not because it takes so much computing power um, and it's really expensive. That's gonna be one of the big hurdles till we figure out how to either do it faster or we increase processing power. Um, but I definitely see um, a lot of our customers um, implementing AI. And in fact, um, if you're if you're an Amazon shopper, um, uh, I think his name is Ralph um, in, in the bottom corner now is the personal assistant to help you buy and, and, and shop for stuff. And so um, a new orange icon appeared. I was like, Ooh, what's that? Of course. And then, of course, I had to ask it a zillion questions to see see what it was about. So um, yeah. we're, we're starting to see customer service um, stuff on the front end. But on the payment side, um, you know, merchants have been using AI to optimize payments and to reduce fraud um, for as long as I can remember. And those those tools are just getting more sophisticated and better. They're able to learn. They're able to infer now a lot more. No, that's right. Dead right. And I think uh, I think we call them opties at checkout uh, when we use our. Uh... Uh, we call payment success managers to use uh, machine learning and AI to kind of uh, improve uh, customers, our customers' performance. Uh, and in fact, back to where we started, I think it's, I think it's probably probably one of the only few places in the world where you can apply data science, machine learning, uh, in the world of something that is generally impacting customer experience and revenue. Um, so these folks are. Uh, super bright people at checkout.com that work on you know our payment opties, um, you know true data sciences and true true use of of of, uh, of AI. And I guess uh, Judy, as you said, it's not surprising that it's the hardware manufacturers and the cloud manufacturers that are doing the best in the AI stakes at the moment. I suppose, uh, given yeah. the amount of computing power that's needed. Yeah, you know, um, was, Judy, what about the? Sorry, again. I was going to say just along yeah. the data science um, angle. One of I was talking to a group of data scientists the other day um, at a university. And they had never thought about applying it towards payments. And I said, oh, it's this whole big thing. And I've even had a couple guys follow up. So that's a great example where a little bit of education in some of the other industries will really help feed the funnel to build some really awesome and creative things. No, it's very cool, very cool. And uh, I, I appreciate you managing the slight delay in the in the, in the the lag and the communications, Julie. So appreciate appreciate that. Um, what about the, the future of the industry then, Julie? I mean, obviously we've got the Payments Essentials course that's out there for folks now, but what do you see in the future? Like what do payments professionals have to have on their radar, maybe for the next five to 10 years? Yeah, we, we sit around and talk about that a lot, about you know what what skills do we really need to have and the, a good understanding of the world, what's going on in the world as it relates to payments and how people pay. Um, because yeah. reconciling those books um, across the globe is hard. And the other thing that has really emerged in the, in the last two years is what I, we always refer to as the unhappy paths of payments. And so right now, refund abuse is a huge problem. Um, and that could be anything from a consumer sending back a product full of uh, cans of beans so that it's the right weight. Um, so it passes the checks and they get the, the return to um, you know buying something legit and returning a copycat um, or just simply claiming, hey, it's fraud, what we call first party uh, misuse and they claim it's fraud and, and it really wasn't. So 
Um, that is kind of front and center is the unhappy pass around payments. Mm -hmm. And so at least for the next three to five years, um, really digging into the unhappy pass to protect revenue um, is going to be a very, very important step. So we've um, we've been in kind of a little bit of a breather, I like to say, where we've been able to focus on expanding payment types and fraud has been staying about the same. Um, but now with um, some of the new unhappy pass and refund abuse, merchants are starting to see losses again. And so um, just taking a breath and saying, okay, what do we need to do to protect that revenue that we've worked so hard to grow? No, yeah, it makes sense. And again, so it's... Um... I guess uh, you know payments professionals now need to get into the world of customer journey mapping and CX overall to find those happy and unhappy moments um, as people go through go through their journey. So we can add that to the world of data science and AI for payment professionals. I guess um, in that, in that sense, Julie. D Julie, two more questions I have for you. Actually, um, um, if you think about you know maybe maybe one thing you'd like the payment industry to do differently, what what would that be? And I hope that's not an unfair question for you. Yeah, it's. Um... I don't know if it's that I'd like it to do differently, but I'd like to see it continue to happen. And that is right now in the payment industry, people really help each other and they share information. Um, and, you know, one of the one of the one of I always call it the MRC magic. When you come to MRC, you can walk up to your competitor. You can walk up to uh, people who are in adjacent markets. And you can say, how are you tackling um, this payment problem, or how do you guys handle tax compliance, you know, in, in Venezuela? And somebody's probably solved that problem, and everybody helps each other. And that is really, really unique to the payments industry. A lot of people have asked me, why do you think that is? And I think one of the reasons why is because we have a common enemy, the fraudster. And so that yeah. naturally yeah. makes us collaborative. Um, and so my hope is, as payments become more strategic and competitive, um, that we can keep that open sharing and transparency um, because there, you can have some trade secrets, but still tax problems should not be your trade secret. So <laughs> in my yeah. opinion. No, it's, it's super interesting you say that. I think we find a very similar thing. I think there's a, there's a real network around the community of payments professionals. Um, checkout runs a payments community. Obviously, we, we work very closely with the MRC. And congratulations to you and your team, Julie. I think you know you, the merchants that are part of your association really do find that community, and they can find that network, um, and and sort of people you know learning from each other. So I think when you have that amount of complexity around the world, I think there's um, enough trade secrets that you can still help each other out in some of the, the more common problems, as you say, uh, and shared shared vision. Um, and I guess my last question to you, Julie, is if um, you know, you're a younger person and you're sitting there and you're thinking about your career. Um, and yeah, we talked about elements of data science and AI and the, the complexity of payments, but why, why should people of a younger generation get into payments? Like what's in store for them? So I have never been so challenged and fascinated in my life. Um, is when I'm dealing with payments. And a lot of people say, why are you still smiling so long after, after such a long career in payments? And I said, because it's really fun and interesting, right? Every day is different. Um, you know, I, I'm continually learning. And so if you like to be challenged and continually learn, be on the what I call the bleeding edge of innovation, um, the payments industry is a really great fit. Um, and what's really interesting is I've had people come into the payments industry and go, eh, it's not really right for me. But the skills and exposure that they had, you get exposed yeah. to so many things because you're getting exposed to the customer service side, to the accounting side, to the tech side, to the data science side. You get a little bit of everything. You know, the marketing side certainly plays a huge role in the programs and the loyalty. So you get a really great exposure to a lot of different kinds of jobs. And so even if it's even if you're not sure hey, this payment's going to be right, it's a great place to jump in and start and get huge exposure to an organization because to be a successful payments person you have to be able to communicate with all aspects of the business. No, it's great. I think it's that perfect uh, balance between the problem solving aspect and then being able to communicate and drive change across an organization. Um, as we've talked about in aspects that are super important and super strategic, like customer experience and, and effectively how you're collecting 
uh, collecting revenue. So, Julie, I think we're, we're pretty much at time and, and just wanted to say thank you and thank you again to your colleagues at the MRC. We've really enjoyed working with you on the Payments Essentials course. We hope that more and more people get into payments and they find that course a way of developing that common language that you so skillfully said at the beginning of the call. And look, we share your passion for payments. We're truly obsessed with payments. Um, and I think that if we can keep that education going, we know that thriving in the digital economy comes from understanding more about payments. Uh, and hopefully we can work together to keep, you know, complexity out of some of our joint uh, merchants uh, arenas as they go around the world. So really appreciate your time, Julie, and thank you very much for your sentiments. Uh, really enjoyed well, speaking with you. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for sponsoring and making uh, it available to so many of our members. It's a, it's a great partnership and I look forward to doing a lot more. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thanks, Julie. Take care. See you soon. Thank you.